everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm joined in the studio with Noor and Rizwana and we'll be making a response to uh, an interview that Michaela Peterson had made um, between two opposing views, uh, between Mohammed Hijab and Ayan Hirsi. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about them during the interview, but let's jump into the first uh, video which we'll be looking into now. Women are expected to cover their bodies and there is some kind of discussion on how much of that. In some cases, they let you show the face and the hands. And in extreme cases, you have to be covered from head to toe, um, confined to the house. Uh, your male guardian uh, chooses, or at least you need his endorsement to marry someone else. And all of this is in, uh, based in Sharia law. If you're a woman and you're not happy in a marriage, it's almost difficult, almost impossible to divorce your husband. Uh, and the other way around, for a man to divorce his wife, all he has to say is declare in front of two witnesses three times that he divorces his wife. Classic Ian Hersey style. So she jumps with a lot of her um, opinions uh, without actually justifying and being a bit more scholarly. But let's go into this question. So the question essentially is, is Islam inherently misogynistic is basically what she's going at. And mm -hmm. she's going using hijab, divorce, guardianship laws, things like that to kind of make her point. So if I start with you, Rizwana, what, what do you think about the what she was talking about? You know, we have to cover from head to toe and it's mm -hmm. so extreme um, yeah. in terms of the hijab and that it's perceived as a negative thing. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, she has she has said that Islam is misogynistic because women have to cover. So we, I mean, the first thing that I immediately thought of was, why is this covering such a bad thing? Is the opposite actually more free? Uh, expect is less covered, um, something that is more liberating? And I don't think so. And so many Muslim women do not think so. Um, rather, you know, dressing modestly is a choice and it actually is a movement now in um we can see in today's society in 2022 back to the olympics in 2020 women are now trying to make decisions for themselves about how to dress yeah rather than catering to the male gaze which i think is hugely powerful so female athletes not wanting to wear um for example gymnasts not wanting to wear the more revealing um, leotards and choosing to wear a full body suit again that choice and that freedom of conscience of deciding what to wear and respecting that for for women so her, for her to say that islam is misogynistic because women are choosing to cover to follow the religion just is um it's not based it's it's nonsensical yeah 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 absolutely and i think it is actually worth talking about the fact that a lot of these gymnasts particularly in america i remember watching the interview of a couple of these gymnasts who were who talked about why they wanted to wear the more um, mm. modest uh, leotards essentially and and it, it's really tricky actually being a female athlete when you're that young and you're going through the process of puberty yes. and um, you're very body self-conscious during that time anyway and you're mm. expected to dress to dress in the way that they that they do now and they feel more comfortable yeah and I think in this country even they've found that the specifics that are required for sport, female sport, are turning away so many young girls from even participating in the sport mm. um, because of that um, uniform that's required that doesn't even have an evidence base <clears throat> in in improving the sport itself. Yes. And your so, performance, actually, as exactly an athlete. Exactly that. Yeah. And then I think one huge example for me that I I remember reading about was um, about Hillary Clinton and how she chose to dress more modestly during her campaign. She decided to wear um, trousers and suits instead of skirts, etc. And when she was asked, it was because um, she had had an incident where she was upskirted oh, um, right. okay. and um, kind of harassed that way um a few incidents i think and she said to take that out of the equation and to help her to you know speak about to, to address the political side of things rather than um be distracted by that exactly yeah. she she made that conscious decision um so can we say that um that decision that she made is um 
you know, is a bad thing. No, absolutely not. We can't. We, and mm. against like human and women's rights as exactly. well. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that what we need to be just really focusing on is whether it's my choice to dress modestly. Mm -hmm. And if it's my choice, then I have, I have to have the right yeah. to do it no matter what it is. It's just, mm. I want to do it this yeah. way. And it cannot be two standards for Muslim women and non-Muslim exactly. women. Like just because um, a Muslim woman is choosing to dress modestly based on her faith, we cannot say that is negative. But actually a Western woman who is moving towards modesty, that's liberating. How, yeah. how can that be yeah. um, reconciled? Or, or even at the ju juxtaposing that to the fact that nuns cover their hair and they dress modestly and they're seen as yeah. devout religious women. And, it, you know, it's like more power to them. Well, actually, Muslim women Why are not? dressing in the same <laughs> way for the same same reasons because mm -hmm. they're devoted to God and it was the same reason why I started dressing more modestly wearing the headscarf as well because I wanted to gain that nearness to God by kind of turning away from more materialistic desires mm -hmm. and that improved my connection with God mm -hmm. so I mean she's I am unfortunately she's kind of missed missed the boat <laughs> on that, I guess mm -hmm. yes. um, but she so she's just seeing the fact that you're all covered up therefore it's negative but there are very many positive experiences and you just have to ask Muslim women who wear their headscarf exactly. to, to mm -hmm. ask why they're wearing it to see that there is a different yep. side of things. The other issue that she raised actually, which was interesting, was the um, issue of divorce and that mm -hmm. there's there, there's a perception that there's a difference in the process within Islam, like between men and women. <laughs> Nora, what do you think about the comment she was saying? I th obviously, if we have a divorce, divorce is, uh, just gives us an op opportunity to separate from someone that we can't live with, that we're not happy to actually live with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's there is one specific way of doing it, which is a divorce, which one way of doing it is obviously the man can say that, that he wants to divorce. But there's also where the woman want to do khula, which is the female version of divorce. So there and is divorce process is divorce. in Islam. Yes. And it's not like different actually no. in Christianity where there isn't that process, yes. Yes. for example. Yes. I think that that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the one really big thing to highlight. Yes. And then where the divorce has to have, obviously both of them agree on having the divorce, mm. khula is, is also mostly done when the woman specifically can't or don't want to live with the husband anymore. And even if he doesn't fully agree with it, she can give up the gifts <coughs> and the things that he gave her. Mm -hmm. And then she can say, I, I just can't do it. I'm doing khula and I'm leaving. Obviously, both of them are like processes that need to be followed as any process in a court or anything that you yeah. need to follow. Even here but, in the UK, yes, there's a process you have to follow. And then, yeah. yeah, so it's, there is a divorce, 100%. There is a way to actually leave a specific person if you're not happy to stay with them yeah. in Islam. And I think it's even more empowering for women when there is like khula specifically, mm. if she yeah. does not or cannot stand staying with that specific yeah. person anymore and actually because the way ayan was saying she was saying that it's really difficult almost for women yes, impossible. Yes, almost yes, impossible, impossible right yes, that's what she but i'm i know of instances in the hadith which i'm sure we're going to touch upon where um there were female companions during the time of the prophet peace be upon him where she approached him and he asked her you know he asked her why she wanted to divorce and, and mm. she just she basically didn't didn't give a specific reason she just want didn't want to be with him anymore and then he granted her the divorce yeah. i mean how hard how hard was that for her to do she approached the prophet and she asked him that doesn't mean that you know she had to go through a rigmarole process that seemed pretty straightforward to be honest yeah and just for an issue of incompatibility so we can see how islam allows for divorce and it allows for women to apply for divorce which is as you said Anne marie it is it is hugely different to what came before so how can ayan hersi ali say that you know it's almost, almost impossible. impossible. Right. Yes, it was almost impossible before Islam came and gave that yes. right to women. So if she's talking about pre-Islam, sure. And even now we see that divorce is such a morass of, um, it's even, it's difficult now in today's society because there's, um, you know, there's so many preconditions mm. and there's so much animosity and there's so much um, that comes with it. Divorce is really prevalent. We know that about yes. um today's society. But Islam um, puts together a very clear framework for both the husband and the wife yeah. to leave the marriage. Yes. A simple framework, yes, actually. Simple. Yes, a simple yeah. frame, framework. Yeah. Yeah. But one that, again, has to, has procedures, um, and that's mm -hmm. to uphold the rights of um, both parties. But in particular, as Noor said, to uphold the rights and empower the woman to be able to leave um, a marriage. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Um, I think what, yeah. Sorry, I think what we need mm-hmm. to also differentiate that when we're talking, yes, it's before Islam, it wasn't the case, but it wasn't the case even like 100 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's, yes. I think that's a really important thing to yes. mention as well. It's, it's, yeah, it's great that now the situation is allowing women yes. to actually get a divorce if they want to. But 100 years ago, it wasn't the case. Like yes, she, absolutely. Even if she, if she wasn't happy, she, she's going to have to stay mm-hmm. or do something to herself to actually yeah. leave that kind of yeah. space. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think so. Now, the fact that Islam has get, given it to a Muslim yeah. woman mm. around 1400 years ago, yeah. just obviously gives us the impression that how much Islam empowered women and actually mm-hmm. gave women their rights much before anyone else did. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. And just going on from that, because um, she mentioned again as one of her points, this issue of guardianship laws, mm-hmm. which uh, have been... Um, The spotlight has been mostly picked upon uh, Saudi Arabia, but other countries as well that operate this idea of guardianship laws. Um, Could you tell us a little bit more about that, what it what it involves and is it actually uh, within Islam or what? I think I think. If I want to first translate guardianship, yeah. it would be wali mm-hmm. in Islam or in Arabic, not in Islam. Yeah. And then uh, the the word wali has is a f- like a basically a mm-hmm. big word that has that can have many meanings depending on the word attached to it, which we call mudaf ile, okay. which is the word after the word wali. So it can be like in the Quran is mentioned, uh, Allah waliyu ladi amanu, and that's in verse two in, in like chapter two, verse two hundred and fifty eight, and that means Allah is a supporter or a proponent of those who believe. Mm-hmm. Now, another verse is saying, Al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat ba'duhum awliya abad. It means, and the believers, men and women, are friends of one another. Mm-hmm. So, wali, and w- another w- another way of putting wali as well, is that wali qariya or wali space, it means the ruler of the area. Mm-hmm. So, it's it's very, very different. The word wali can be used very differently depending on the word after it. Okay. Now, if we go wali al mar'a, it's like the guardian of the woman, is a person that is required for the nikah, in terms to represent the woman for the nikah to be valid. Yes. Now, when when I heard that question and when I heard her talking about guardianship mm. and the way that I that she actually represented guardianship is that the woman has no say whatsoever yes. yeah. in in what the guardian decide, which is very very far from the truth. I think when when we're talking about wali al mar'a, wali is mostly is is only actually used in nikah. Like yeah. it's, it's yeah. when the, the wali is required to to do the nikah. Now and nikah uh, being the, the marriage the contract, marriage, yeah, the, yeah, the marriage contract, marriage contract. Yeah. marriage contract. Now when but the nikah to start with, the nikah cannot be valid without the woman actually approving to yes. it. Yes, and she then has to consent to it. Yes, consent to it exactly. So there is that. There is one hadith that mentioned uh, Hazrat Khansa bin Khaddam al Ansariya, and she is a Muslim woman. She went to Hazrat Muhammad sallam and said that her father wants her to marry someone that she doesn't want, and there is another person that she wants to marry, and he said la nikah halahu in kahimashiti. Like there is no nikah. Is mm-hmm. like this nikah is not valid. Go and marry whoever you please, and this this obviously brings us to the point that the, to start with, the nikah cannot be valid if she's not happy. Mm-hmm. Now, why does the wali? Why is the wali important? Why is it important to have a wali? Now, obviously, the nikah is when we're talking about nikah, which is the marriage, the Muslim Islamic marriage, is to announce to people that this marriage has happened. It's mm-hmm. sort of a it's a social it's sort of contract, contract. Yeah, yeah. social contract that governs the right of both female and male and it usually happens in the premises of the mosque or if if there is any specific area and when there are men they usually the father or the wali is representing to the woman so for them to actually say have you accepted then that's that mm-hmm. would be the husband's father then they would ask the father have you accepted the the marriage to happen then he's basically uh, what i how i understand it is like he's conveying the yes yes of the woman yeah. and the girl and saying that yes she's accepted and i'm happy with this yes yeah. and that's that's the main thing i understand so of course it's it's it is important to have a guardian mm-hmm. obviously for in terms of like saving your rights mm-hmm. and then making sure that it's clear for everyone it's also the important like to have two witnesses and that's part of the nikah mm-hmm. now but what's important to start with is the woman saying yes is yes. she being happy with yes. the nikah consenting to the nikah and yeah. when when you come and say oh she needs guardian for everything that is 
Like, that's no, not, it's not what no, it's yeah. not what the actually the meaning Islam says as well actually yes, about yes. it in the first place. Yes.